Well, this is it, folks. Only one more game left before we're temporarily finished with the Persona series. It feels kind of weird ending this bunch of videos with the second game, but it's my own fault for starting with Persona 5 and working my way downwards, then sloppily throwing the spin-offs in the middle. So last time we took a look at the first of this two-part story, Innocent Sin, which was definitely not one of my favorites in the series, as it was rather flawed, but an interesting game nonetheless. Now we're going to be continuing the Persona 2 duology with the second part released in 2000 for the PlayStation 1, known as Persona 2 Eternal Punishment. Come on, Common, let's wrap this up. Fine, just no more half-hour videos, alright? I can't make any promises. <sighs> As a quick reminder, Innocent Sin started off as a Japanese-only title back in 1999, with everyone else not seeing it until the PSP remaster in 2011, acting as part one of a duology. However, for whatever reason, Eternal Punishment was okay to come out in the US when they never received Innocent Sin. Europeans basically got screwed over by not having either of the Persona 2 games. Again, at least not until Innocent Sin's remaster. Even with the PS3 port for Eternal Punishment, though, only Japan and the US are able to buy and download it. They did this with Revelations Persona 2 until the PlayStation Classic was made, and with the PS2 version of Persona 4, but Europeans can still get Persona 3 FES, so what the hell, Atlas? I'm only harping on about this because, well, despite my American accent, I've been living in the UK for 15 plus years. This made recording Eternal Punishment a bit of a pain for me because in order to get the most authentic experience I could, I had to hack into my PlayStation Classic and emulate the game, which ran fine, but sometimes it would crash and boot me back back to the game selection screen. I know that emulation's not perfect, and this hack will no doubt help in the future, but it was annoying when that happened, especially after spending a long time on a boss fight. Anyhow, so apparently because Innocent Sin didn't sell as well as Atlas hoped for in 1999, the writer for Persona 1 and 2, Tadashi Satomi, was asked to create a story for a sequel in order to regain sales, and, you know, maybe release it somewhere outside of Japan? Just a thought. Well, Atlas certainly didn't seem to learn their lesson by 2013 when they remade Eternal Punishment for the PSP in the same style as Innocent Sin. It pretty much has all the added bells and whistles from that version to make the gameplay more streamlined and a bit nicer to look at, on top of adding a new story campaign for Tatsuya. To this day, though, for some reason the PSP remaster of Eternal Punishment is still a Japanese-only release. Yeah, at this point the PSP was basically dead, but why give Western audiences the remade Innocent Sin and not Eternal Punishment? It's funny how during the PS1 days we were given two parts story with no part one, and the PSP version gives you part one without part two. There has been a fan translation of the PSP PSP Eternal Punishment in the works for years, but as of right now, it's still not done. So it's hard to tell when we'll actually get to see an English release, if at all. It's a really big shame, too, because in the hour I played of this version, I found it to be more enjoyable than the PS1 original. It's faster, it's cleaner, it's prettier, it just feels better overall. In the unlikely event that Atlas re-releases this for Western audiences, or the fan translation gets completed, I'll give Eternal Punishment another look and perhaps do another video about it, but for now, unless you're fluent in Japanese, we're not going to be playing it anytime soon. Once more, before we go deeper into Eternal Punishment's gameplay, we'll talk about the plot to see how this epic journey concludes. And by the way, we will be spoiling things from Innocent Sin as well, so keep that in mind. Time code's here, you know what to do, let's get to it. The story now takes place in another reality to Innocent Sin, after the cast of that game wiped out their memory of the first meeting as children in order to return their world to normal. However, if their memories come back to them, then Earth will continue ceasing to exist. The protagonist this time is Mae Amano, one of the main characters from Innocent Sin, who has now been given the silent treatment, while the returning Tatsuya actually gets to speak. The game begins with Maya at her job, still working as a photojournalist for the Coolest Magazine, yeah, that's its name, where she's sent by her boss to investigate rumors about the Joker's curse. It's similar to the last game. You call your own cell number to summon the Joker, only instead of granting wishes, he'll now kill upon request. You're essentially summoning a hitman now. Maya then meets up with her best friend Ulala, who we briefly saw in Innocent Sin as she decides to help her finish the article faster so they can go partying. Maya and Ulala make their way to Seven Sisters to try and get some info, coming across Tatsuya's older brother, Katsuya, a detective who's also asking around about the Joker rumors. Katsuya actually does make an occasional brief appearance in Innocent Sin, but he never played into the story all that much. He was just kind of there, same as Ulala. After a little exploring around the school, the three of them stumble upon the murdered body of the Seven 
sister's principal, which seems to be the work of the Joker himself, looking a bit different this time around. He attacks the group, which forces them to call forth their personas. Again, a lot sooner than I expected. And Philemon introduces himself once more to warn the characters of potential dangers. They follow the Joker to the school's clock tower as she tries to force Anna, the student who would eventually become Lady Scorpio, to recall the events of Innocent Sin. After thwarting his demons, the Joker attacks. But Tatsuya saves Maya and the others at the last minute, and he seems to remember everything that happened in the previous game, though he doesn't want Maya to figure anything out, so he leaves in a flash. Katsuya is then removed from the Joker case for reasons unknown, but he's determined to arrest the Joker himself, joining Maya and Ulala in their search. The party begins their investigation by meeting with Bao Fu, the owner of a webpage that collects all the city's rumors, as well as an extortionist and a professional blackmailer, on top of having his own persona. This guy sure gets around, and I think he was also mentioned in the last game as well. Bao Fu has managed to acquire some information about Tatsuya Sudo, aka King Leo from Medicine Sin, and his father Tatsuzo. Okay, can we please have a character that doesn't start with Tots? This is difficult to summarize as it is. Anyway, they seem to have affiliated with the Joker, so our team head over to the mental institution that King Leo's being held in. Once they enter, they discover bodies of what appeared to be the Taiwanese Mafia sent in by Tatsuzo to kill King Leo. After wandering around for a bit, we see that King Leo was broken out of his cell, killing more people along the way, and admitting to not only being the Joker, but also attempting to restore the original timeline from Innocent Sin. Wow, that was fast. King Leo escapes to the Sky Museum from the last game, and as the group enter, they coincidentally come across Jun, as the museum gets set ablaze like before. Deja vu, huh? After going through literally the same dungeon and rescuing the kids, again, everyone makes it to the rooftop to battle King Leo, again, with Jun being held captive, and Tatsuya making another appearance. There's a boss fight against him you have to do, and as the building continues to crumble, Jun pushes King Leo into a nearby hole. The team gets off the burning museum by flying a blimp, again, with Tatsuya not tagging along again, once everyone jumps off, and Jun is left to carry on with his life. The party then split up to find out what Tatsuzo's going to do next, and Maya stumbles upon reports of people turning into new jokers thanks to this negative energy called kegare consisting of pessimistic feelings such as jealousy and hatred it's actually kind of creepy seeing the new jokers in person almost like when the joker from batman 89 turned those people into laughing lunatics it's especially disturbing when one of those new jokers is ooh la la who used the curse on maya when she was drunk and is filled with self-loathing i rather like the idea of how anybody could turn into a joker it's an interesting way of seeing who's twisted enough to put a hit on someone and pay the consequences for it. But this whole plot thread gets dropped during the second half of the game before it could be developed further, and that's disappointing to me. Well, after defeating Ooh La La in another boss battle, she gets treated in the Velvet Room and returns to normal. The next new Joker is Anna's sister, who gets dealt with fairly quickly, but then the group receive a tip from an outsider informing them that Tatsuzo's organization, the New World Order, are controlling the police, giant corporations, and the media for their own gain. As well as this, there are two other people currently scrutinizing this phenomenon, and they turn out to be Ellie and Nanjo from Persona 1. Ellie and Nanjo are involved because they believe that Kandori, the main antagonist of the original Persona, may have returned and is in cahoots with Tatsuzo. Additionally, they think this massive fortune-telling craze going on in Sumaru might also be used to the New World Order's advantage by gaining information and spreading more rumors. This is the point where Ellie and Nanjo are able to join your party, and the story branches into two paths. If you choose Ellie, you explore the TV station and stop the person behind the fortune-telling, Chizuro Ishigami, which also coincidentally seems to be where Lisa and her girl group are, as well as Jun's mother, so they all need to be rescued too. Choosing Nanjo has you trudge through the sewers with some further assistance from Maki and Reishi, and then to a secret laboratory holding kidnapped jokers. I want to quickly say how much I like the changes made between Maki and Ellie. Maki's a lot more cheery than she was in the first persona, often joking around and not taking things too seriously, which I think is a great way of showing how much she's grown as a person. Ellie's roughly similar, but in her case, it's almost like she wants there to be danger, just for the thrill of it all. Like when you get to the TV station and they find themselves trapped in some other world behind a mirror, and Ellie actually seems excited about it. God, I love her. If you pick Nanjo's route though, you'll accidentally bump into Eikichi, who's looking for his captured friend and will temporarily accompany you. Once you make it to the end of the lab, you'll see that Kandori really is still alive, but Tatsuya again comes in the nick of time to battle him while everyone else evades Kandori's army. And you then deal with Eikichi's friend, who's been turned into a freakish monster. As for Ellie's route, 
out. Chizuru transforms June's mother into a Joker, so while Tatsuya again has to save the day by fighting her, the party will need to take down Chizuru in yet another boss fight. Both Kandori and Chizuru get away along with Tatsuya, and a lot of stuff kind of just happens until the last third of the game. You have to stop Genji Sasaki, aka Prince Taurus, from holding a seminar with a machine controlling Kagare, but breaking it turns him into a Joker, so he needs to be defeated as well. You then discover that the captain of the Sumaru Police Department is a mole for Tatsuzo, which of course means that he has to die! Although beforehand, the chief sneakily informs Katsuya that the New World Order plan once again raised Sumaru off the ground via another rumored spaceship come to life, this time called the Torafune, and concentrate all matters of Kigare into Sumaru so that rumored dragons can be drawn into and destroy the city. You know, we had the Nazis and aliens and god knows what else in the last game, so having dragons show up all of a sudden doesn't seem all that far-fetched now anymore. Kinda sounds like a box standard RPG plot if you ask me. Afterwards, Baofu deals with the head of the Taiwanese Mafia for killing his partner, and then the party locate Kandori and Chizuru again in the undersea ruins, who were both beaten at long last, staying behind as everything crumbles around them. Tatsuya comes back once more to help out during that fight, and at this point, the group and probably the player want Tatsuya to give them some answers. This is where the plot finally gets going again, as Tatsuya explains through the flashbacks in Mount Iwato what happened at the end of Innocent Sin, while also showing events after the original Persona via Nanjo's and Ellie's memories, with character portraits that somehow look better here than they did in the PSP remaster for Persona 1. And it's sort of weird how the original cast have their Japanese designs now, but still have their English names from Revelations. I suppose that was to save confusion at the time and try to make the best of both worlds, but seeing how everyone else gets to use their Japanese names, it's quite strange. Tatsuya tells them about the alternate timeline and how Maya was supposed to be dead, and it seems that she now remembers everything, which was actually kind of heartbreaking seeing Maya so upset like this. Depending on who you had in your party, Ellie or Nanjo decide to part ways from here onwards and help more people in need of around Sumaru, with Tatsuya acting as a replacement. The next step is to catch Tatsuzo and the New World Order in Torifume, but unfortunately they make it to the top just a little too late as Sumaru is lifted into the sky again and Tatsuzo escapes to Sumaru Castle. After exploring all around the castle, the party finally take on Tatsuzo, along with the New World Order's mummy god, Gozen, who honestly we feel is a pretty pointless inclusion given that the boss fight is the only time we actually get to see him. I mean, don't get me wrong, I actually do kind of like the fight, but it's kind of a letdown. But hey, that's just me. However, upon his defeat, Sumeru returns to the ground, and the gang are then transported to the land of the Collective Unconscious, hosted by the returning Nyarlathotep, now taking the form of Tatsuya, and once again acting as the new main antagonist next to another antagonist that got more screen time. Nyarlathotep has captured Eikichi, Lisa, and June to try and make them remember the original timeline so that Earth will remain destroyed, each of them guarded by Shadow versions of the newer team, who, as expected, are defeated after their respective boss encounters. After an innocent Sin crew member is saved, they're moved out of the collective unconscious by Philemon in his golden butterfly appearance, which I'm only now realizing we failed to mention in the last couple of videos, and any velvet butterflies you see after Persona 2 is actually Philemon, except for Persona 5. At the end of the collective unconsciousness is Narloptep again, waiting for the final battle. This fight's definitely a bit harder than the first one in Innocent Sin, it's just as long to boot as well. Luckily, you're able to leave the dungeon at any time, so take that opportunity to buy as many revival items as you can. Trust me, you're gonna need every single one. Now, Tholtep is defeated for good nonetheless, but now Tatsuya has to fulfill his end of the bargain by going back to the original timeline and forgetting the day he met Ekichi, Lisa, Jun, and Maya. That is, after he steals a kiss from Maya first, if you choose the right dialogue option. Cue the sitcom audience reaction. Kind of funny that the older Persona game actually shows the kiss on screen, and yet the later entries fade to black before anything happens. Freaking teases. Anyway, Tatsuya punches Maya to stop her from coming along, a bit unnecessary if you ask me, and separates himself from the Tatsuya of this world. Sumeru is back to its normal self, the two Suo brothers learn to get along better, Baofu and Ulala are now running a search agency for missing people, and Maya continues to work for Coolest Magazine. However, once she steps outside, she thinks she spots Tatsuya again, but to decides to leave things how they currently are, possibly hoping that they might get a chance to speak to each other again someday. Boy, howdy, I gotta tell you folks, this story was not as interesting to me as it was in Innocent Sin. Eternal Punishment has the same problem that its predecessor had, where there's simply too much going on. Except here, I think it's even worse. For as crazy as Innocent Sin got, and I mean really crazy, at least all of that imagery was mostly set to the side and you dealt with it as you went through the game. The problem with Eternal Punishment is that we now also have to include moles in the police force, multiple jokers, old foes returning and being thrown away just as easily, negative 
feelings literally bottled up, and most importantly, going through a lot of the same places we've already seen in Innocent Sin. I suppose the sense of deja vu is meant to be the point of Eternal Punishment, given the context of the story, but I think they went a little overboard with it, because it often feels like I'm just playing Innocent Sin again with a slightly different plot. Now saying that, where most Persona games focus on the main characters being teenagers who are discovering their true selves and exploring the human psyche, Eternal Punishment's cast is so far the only time in the series that consists of adults going through the same internal issues, and that by itself is intriguing. I hoped that if I was basically going through Innocent Sin again that the cast of Eternal Punishment would be just as engaging, but I'm sorry, I did not gravitate towards these guys. They have next to no chemistry in my opinion. The characters act more like co-workers similar to what I thought of C's in Persona 3, but that's mixed in with the constant bickering the investigation team had in Persona 4, though at least in that game there were no hard feelings towards each other. Eternal Punishment on the other hand, for starters, Maya doesn't speak anymore so unless you already played Innocent Sin, playing her off as an upbeat positive person is something you're just gonna have to take the game's word on, although granted I did enjoy the few moments where she got a little emotional. Then there's Katsuya and Baofu who don't trust each other throughout a majority of the game. Baofu in general to me is such an unlikable jackass who thinks he's better than everyone, insulting the other party members frequently and barely changing his personality by endgame. His dead partner gets mentioned like two or three times in the whole game, and we learn about his previous job way too damn late which doesn't even come back to the story much, and then that's it. That's all the development we get out of Baofu, and yes I know that part of his character is how much of a mystery he is, but that doesn't necessarily make him compelling, especially when he's so cold to everyone around him. Katsuya is a little better at this I find. Despite being a rather stiff person and not knowing much about his backstory, we do see him keep getting screwed over by the police department he works for, wondering whether or not justice is truly on his side, and he does clearly care a great deal for his younger brother, which is more than I can say for Baofu. Ulala is probably one of the other better party members. She's just doing all she can to help out Maya, even if she does get a bit jealous of her sometimes. I overall thought the friendship between Ulala and Maya was one of the more well-done aspects of the story and characters. Ellie and Nanjo are about the same as they were in Persona 1, except Nanjo's not quite as pompous as he was before. As for Tatsuya, sadly I don't think he's as good of a character in Eternal Punishment as he was in Innocent Sin. You can tell in the previous game that Tatsuya wasn't the most serious of people, particularly with some of the dialogue options and goofy animations while contacting enemies, but he wasn't exactly oblivious to what's going on around him either. The most I got out of Eternal Punishment's Tatsuya is that he's so freaking gloomy all the time, and I understand why he acts this way. He's having to stay away from his friends because of what happened at the end of Innocent Sin, but I wish he could have at least tried to be a little more friendly with everyone instead of continuously brushing them off like flies. It makes Tatsuya seem like a jerk at first, when I know he's not because I played Innocent Sin beforehand. I realize I keep comparing Eternal Punishment's cast to Innocent Sin's, but the characters in that game were just so good that it's all the more disappointing to see Eternal Punishment's not be nearly as well-rounded. Honestly, for Josh, I do have to say that I do agree with a lot he says. The one thing I will say is that I do actually appreciate that we have a much older cast this time. There's one thing about Persona that I've seen online is that people have been wanting to see a much more older cast, as well as having more female leads. And this kind of scratches the itch for both of those. Don't get me wrong, there are some things that are, you know, kind of head-scratching here and there, but those are minor nitpicks that I don't feel like need to be brought up here. But I do feel like that having this kind of cast is actually pretty interesting and can show that still having a more adult cast can work and not be limited to a high school situation with the characters. It's fun, and it actually has a bit more application to the real world. However, just like in Innocent Sin, Eternal Punishment is a good-looking PS1 game, especially for its time. It's a lot more detailed than Revelations Persona, although the frame rate can sometimes be a bit choppy and has some incredibly slow moving cracks. And it's pretty hilarious to see the early days of censorship when the game bleeps all the F-bombs. Being a PS1 game as well, the voice acting is not going to be winning any awards either. Some of it can be passable, but a big chunk of the acting as well... This is PS1 video game voice acting, what were you expecting? At the very least, it's on par with Resident Evil. Oh my word, special mentions to Tatsuya and Nanjo sounding like they just went with the first take. Guys, don't go. Don't leave me alone. Your act makes me sick. I do not want to see you lower yourself. Well, whatever you think of the characters and their acting, it's cool that this is also the first game in the series with star female protagonist, that being Maya. Hey, didn't you get some flack in one of your videos, Josh, for forgetting about Maya? I was just getting to that. 
Okay, so, back in my Persona 3 review, while talking about the portable version, I was wondering why the female protagonist was the only one Atlas had ever done, as it was a pretty cool idea. She had exclusive social links, brand new cutscenes, different music, and you could date a few of your best boys if you wanted to. But as soon as I asked that, so many of you were quick to point out that Maya is actually the first female protagonist and not the P3P one. In my defense though, while it is true I didn't know about Maya back then, and I did phrase it somewhat poorly, I was mainly talking about the female protagonists that are supposed to be a representation of yourself, the player. Maya already had a pre-established character in Innocent Sin. She was cheery, optimistic, and laughs at the face of danger, whereas the Femme C in Persona 3 Portable did not have a pre-established character. Oh sure, she definitely has a personality, which could be seen through dialogue options, but it's ultimately up to the player as to how you want to shape her character. Maya in Eternal Punishment kind of has something similar, though there are so few opportunities to choose what she says, and there isn't a great difference between the choices that it's not really worth mentioning. I know that Western audiences couldn't play Innocent Sin on the PS1, so that probably makes this whole point moot, but to me, that doesn't matter. Japan still had access to Innocent Sin first, and thus Maya had her character set out for her. Nevertheless, I still got it wrong. Maya is the true original female protagonist within the Persona series, and I'm very sorry for getting that incorrect in the Persona 3 video. I didn't forget about Maya, I just didn't know about her, so we cool? Can you all now stop reminding me about Maya the Messiah? Uh, almost. There's actually one more thing we didn't mention about the Femme MC's name being Katone Shiomi in the Persona 3 play. <sighs> okay, moving on. You may have noticed us using the word again a lot during the plot summary, and that's the perfect way to describe Eternal Punishment. It's too much of the same thing, though that's mostly with the gameplay. There isn't much to talk about that we didn't already cover in the Innocent Sin video. Persona switching can still be pretty tedious, particularly when you're healing after a battle. All of the fusion spells are back and have the same pros and cons as before, and the battle system isn't all that different. We briefly went through it in the previous video, but we'll give a quick recap. Choosing actions for party members require you to press the strategy option, pick a character, and then tell them what you want them to do. You do this for every single member, arrange the order for who gets to act first if necessary, press the battle option, and see how everything goes. Unfortunately, like with the PS1 version of Innocent Sin, this gets very dull after a while. Although something we forgot to mention last time is that you can cancel everyone's turn at any time in the battle, in case if things aren't working out to your favor. Just be sure that the characters have decent agility if they're acting in battle first. The contact system is once again another viable option for dealing with enemies, and this may possibly be the best iteration of it in the old school Persona games. Instead of having multiple choices per character, everyone now has a singular trait to use to their advantage. So for example, there's Maya's journalistic abilities, Bao Fu's blackmailing, Ulala's fortune telling, or Ellie's fashion modeling. Just like before, should you wish to do so, you can also send out a mixture of characters for even more results. Depending on which ones you choose in which order, this is much more simple than how the previous two games handle it. Though contacting enemies is again just plain uninteresting, and the whole tarot card procedure for creating personas still takes a bunch of unnecessary time, and hey, I'm just glad that they kind of evolved the system in some regard. I definitely agree, though sometimes contacting enemies did get me out of a jam if I was facing against a really tough foe. Like these tall Jesus ones that take a million hits to kill, but will have no problem taking you down in only a few strikes. Quick tip, always use Katsuya. That'll make him eager, thus giving you a bunch of his tarot cards, and immediately end the battle. I personally try not to worry too much about tarot cards, and spend plenty of time leveling up my party. I would absolutely not recommend Eternal Punishment as your first entry in the series or playing it before Innocent Sin. This game isn't very beginner friendly, not just because of the story, but the gameplay is a lot harder too. Perhaps the most difficult game in the series. Persona 3, I am so sorry. I thought you were going to be the most challenging title, but this one just slightly beats it. You may be able to save anywhere you want again, but Eternal Punishment can be just as punishing, if not more so than the answer section of Persona 3. The name fits, I guess. And you can't even leave the dungeon to restock on supplies. You have to be damn sure you're prepared for what's up ahead. Especially when it comes to the bosses. I did not enjoy these at all. They themselves aren't too much trouble, but I swear to god for like two-thirds of the game, they always have a few henchmen with them that are nearly as powerful, and those attacks build up, wiping out your party very swiftly. The boss fight against Kandori, that's all I'll say. Oh, but nothing compares to the old maid move that half of the bosses absolutely love 
to spam. You try attacking after they unleash this and all that damage you do will go straight to your teammates, sometimes killing them instantly. This particularly is the case if you have Tatsuya in your party who's a way higher level than anyone else, completely ruining your chance to share any more experience points with the rest of the group. Seriously, screw that move. You know, at least in Persona 3, I didn't need to think too much about what personas and skills might be needed, but here, it's as if they were intentionally designed for a specific fusion spell that covers all enemies, which means fusing personas with the necessary skills, which means a ton of grinding if you aren't properly equipped. The fight at the end of Tora Fune is a perfect example for this. According to a walkthrough I looked up online, he's weak to fire, but every time he hits you, he'll gain 700 HP back. That means even with his weakness, there's only so much you can hurt him before you run out of SP or die. I fought this guy for like an hour and ended up shit out of luck, wasting all of that time. This is where the guide suggested that I use a skill called Makakaja, which increases your spell power. Suddenly, I was doing at least twice the amount of damage, and I won a lot more easily. It's that level of crap you have to deal with that really irks me, and I don't see it as good design. The last thing I'll add is for the love of God, get Meteorama as early as you can. There are a few things I do want to say about the difficulty. Like, I didn't bring this up before, but in the last game that we talked about, it was a little bit too easy, especially when you consider that the remake made things way more easier than it should have been. Like, there was also that whole dispense spamming thing that also made it a bit of an issue for people to actually, you know, find challenge in the game. But for this one, it's like they turned the difficulty up to 10. Like, I remember dying to those golden versions of the original group quite a few times, because holy hell, those things are tough to beat. Hot damn! You know what my biggest problem with Eternal Punishment is, though, aside from the repeated areas? It's too damn long. My overall time was 40 hours, compared to Innocent Sin's 30 hours, and Jesus, did this one feel way longer than it really needed to be. If you took out all of the recycled dungeons and just stuck with the new ones, it'd be a 20-hour game at most. As soon as I reached Torafune, Eternal Punishment's equivalent to Zabalba from the previous title, I was thinking this would be the last section of the game since it was Innocent Sin's final dungeon, but I was shocked to find that there was still more going on, to which I was seriously starting to wonder when Eternal Punishment was going to end. To be honest, I think this game drags a fair bit, and that's mostly thanks to repeating stuff I already did in Innocent Sin, which I realize is an unfair critique given that Eternal Punishment released in the West first, but that wasn't the case in Japan. They had access to both parts of the story at the time, so Japanese players had to deal with playing through the same dungeons back to back, and now that everyone else has access to Innocent Sin, there's no reason to play Eternal Punishment first, which is something I cannot help. Why would I play part two of a story before playing part one? I had to put my Kane and Rinse podcast on to prevent my mind from wandering off, and that could be because I've been playing three of these types of Persona games in a short amount of time, but the repetition was nevertheless wearing me out. That's not all, though. If you beat the game with both Nanjo and Ellie's roots completed, you'll have access to an extra dungeon. For those who skipped out on the story synopsis, there's a point in the game where you have to choose either Nanjo or Ellie to join your team, both of whom come with different dungeons and scenarios. But you can't do both at the same time, so that means in order to access the dungeon, you have to play through the game twice in a row. The extra dungeon is basically a one giant test from Philemon where you travel through the redesigned dungeons from the main game, and the goal is to find a teleport in each one that warps you back to school, acting as a central hub. The twist with these dungeons, though, is that they put you in different circumstances, such as clearing an area within a time limit, reaching the end of the stage where a mile never stops from running, or finding tools that belong to King Leo so he can restore his lost memory of who he is. Wait, why would he want to do that again? For the most part, clearing the extra dungeon wasn't too much of a pain to do. I mean, some parts were more annoying than others, but I still managed to get through them okay, even with the higher leveled enemies in my way. However, my least favorite sections were undoubtedly near the end. I'm really glad I was using a guide for this bit because I would have been wandering forever trying to figure this out. It's when you're exploring the second to last area just after answering these questions that you need a photographic memory of the game to get right, but at least there are hints scattered around to give you an idea. No, the segment I'm talking about is immediately afterwards where you need to pass through a fire to access the next room, and you're supposed to check this specific door multiple times before you're told to speak with the demon Jack-O-Lantern, or Pyro Jack as we'll know him in future games. So you need to go back to the area you just traveled in and keep randomly encountering enemies until you finally see a Pyro Jack, form a contract with him, and then randomly encounter another Pyro Jack to get information from him, telling you to meet with his friend Jack Frost. For the record, I encountered way more Jack Frost at this point than I did Pyro Jack, so why couldn't I have just asked him in the first 
first place. Well, anyway, after forming a contract with a Jack Frost and finding another one, making him happy again gives you a brand new option of putting out the fire. All right, cool. However, upon going back to the school, he says he needs more of his friends to assist him. Turns out you need to hire four Jack Frost to douse the flames, each of them with different requirements to meet before they agree to help. The second one isn't too bad. He just asks you simple questions and you need to get all of the answers right. The third one's obnoxious, though. You need to dispose of any male party members and only have females, meaning encountering regular enemies just got a whole lot harder. All because this Jack Frost is a player. The fourth one luckily just asks you questions again, albeit much trickier since you're supposed to act as if you're lazy like him, but afterwards you go back to the locked door from earlier where the fifth and final Jack Frost meets with his buddies. You then hear screams in the distance and as you investigate the fire, oh my god we committed frost aside! Well now I feel awful. That leaves us with the last portion of the extra dungeon, though. You're in the past where you meet with Maya Okamura, who needs funds to take down this giant metal plate. So if you agree to help her out, she'll then snag all of your money without warning. Good thing I saw this in the guide beforehand and bought as many items as I could, but that's still a dick move. Even then, that's still not enough money for her, as she now requires 5 million yen to remove the plate. This is where you stumble upon the final area that holds 5 fancy coins in 5 separate treasure chests that sell for 1 million yen each by the healing fairy Trish, who's helped you out throughout the past few games, though I didn't really use her much personally. The catch with this area, however, is that there will be times where one by one you have to remove a party member until Maya's the last person standing. My patience had worn incredibly thin by this point in the game, and after dealing with everything it's put me through, only to then ask me to fight really strong enemies with fewer party members, and being forced to battle a new one at the very end with just Maya, all without saving, I caved in and and started using save states. Yeah, I cheated. What are you gonna do about it? Depending on how you play your cards, the extra dungeon could last between five to eight hours, but at the very end is the true final boss of the game, Philemon himself. Without question, the hardest fight in the entire game. Well, at least the ones that don't have henchmen. Truthfully though, it's actually not as ball-bustingly difficult as I thought it would be. Don't get me wrong, Philemon will completely destroy you if you're too careless, and I had to purchase plenty of revival items. But as long as you keep using Makakaja on your party members to beef up their spells, and consistently cast Makara Karn on them to reflect some of Philemon's magic attacks, it's definitely not impossible to beat him, compared to someone like Elizabeth from Persona 3 where there were a lot of prerequisites. I didn't even have to grind at all, my party was mostly in their mid to late 60s with Tatsuya being at level 71, and I managed to win the fight on my very first attempt. That's never happened to me with a Persona super boss before, but I surprisingly kinda enjoyed this battle. And I also like how Philemon constantly praises you to not only make you feel less stressed, but give him a little more character as well. You're doing well. Even if you try to leave the fight, he'll encourage you to keep trying. Why is this guy not a reoccurring super boss? If you manage to defeat Philemon anyway, you're given a rank based on how well you cleared the dungeon. It's all based on how fast you did it, the best being less than 8 hours, and how many of the 3 hidden butterflies you found in certain areas. You can retry as many times as you want with everything carried over, and you unlock 2 new features in the Velvet Room. They're nothing too special though, Nameless will just allow you to replay some of the game's cutscenes, and Igor lets you use the Velvet Room telephone to... Listen to the characters answering machines. Let's speak positively. Your messages should be optimistic. Okay, that's a thing. They're amusing, I'll give it that, but why? It's artless, man. Don't question it. Then I won't. I was originally not going to bother with this dungeon because after my first playthrough of Eternal Punishment, I just had enough. I didn't want to go through the game again for one extra dungeon, but of course, being the Persona fan that I am, wanting to do as much as possible, I sucked it up and finished the game twice with both Ellie's and Nanjo's routes done. Was it worth it? Not really, no. Well, maybe except for the Philemon fight. That was pretty cool to see. Shame that this is the last time we truly see him in the series, though. Gotta say, folks, I wasn't wholly impressed with this game. Nearly everything about Eternal Punishment to me feels lesser compared to Innocent Sin. It's not a bad game by any means, and I still think it's better than Persona 1, but I can't say I had the best time with it either. I don't know, dude. This one just doesn't do it for me. I found the story weaker, the characters weaker, and even the gameplay weaker. And that's not just because I played the PSP remaster of Innocent Sin, which came out way after Eternal Punishment. I had my share of problems with that game too, but its cast and bizarre imagery 
was what kept me intrigued. That, and Eternal Punishment, in my opinion, takes itself a bit too seriously. I like that the party mostly consists of full-grown adults, which is something the next main Persona game should really consider doing, but I believe they need to click far better than these guys and gals do, and not be void of fun either. The graphics, as we mentioned earlier, are rather nice, but I sadly can't say the same for the music. They didn't stick with me personally, with the exception of the boss theme, that one's actually alright. I'm very sorry to anybody that absolutely loves Eternal Punishment, and like I said at the start of this video, I'm more than willing to give it another shot if the PSP remaster gets localized, because I really want to appreciate the game more than I currently do, but as of right now, not a fan. I just wanted Eternal Punishment to end after a while, and this is something I won't be playing again for a very, very long time. Although, I will say this, it has made me appreciate Persona 3 a bit more. Eternal Punishment is a fun game, and while I do have memories of dealing with it and being like throwing my controller against the wall due to how tough it was, it was still a fun experience and one that actually was nice to go back to. Bit of a shame that we never got that remake over here in America, especially considering the fact that nowadays the best way to get this game is through emulation unless you want to shell out hundreds of dollars for it. Like, ugh. Still, if you can, emulate the game, play it, and hey, give your own thoughts on it. Once more, thanks very much, Common, for sharing your thoughts on the game and hope to see you again in future videos. You are very welcome, and once again, do please come and check out my channel and watch me as I recently suffered through Magical Girl Friendship Squad. But is it as bad as people make it out to be? Well, yeah, but you're gonna have to find out and see, aren't you? Go on, click the link in the description. I'll be waiting, and thanks for watching. Sure. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are at long last done with the Persona series, but just for the hell of it, let's go down the list of games and rank them from worst to best. I know you guys already know what my favorite one is, and this is strictly my opinion, so feel free to disagree, but come on, it'll be fun. In last place is the one and only Revelations Persona. Everything has to start somewhere, but unfortunately, that also means this one is arguably the most dated of the lot, and the butchered localization doesn't help either. In 10th place is the PSP version of Persona 1. I was tempted to put this in conjunction with Revelations, but this remaster does add a couple of things to make it a bit more tolerable. Ninth place goes to Persona 2 Eternal Punishment. It just didn't do a great deal for me personally. Too much was recycled, and most of it, as explained throughout the video, felt inferior to Innocence sin. Eighth place is the Persona 4 Arena games. Perfectly enjoyable when you're actually playing them, but the story modes for each one bore me to tears. Number seven is Persona 2 Innocent Sin. A great cast of characters with an insane but certainly creative story, and much better gameplay than the original Persona, but still has some niggles to get rid of. Number six is the Persona Dancing series. I'm putting them all in one spot since they're all pretty much the same as one another. Highly addictive games that I constantly find myself coming back to, but the stories for every single one blows, and the Persona 5 track list could have been better if they waited for Royal to come out. Fifth place goes to Persona Q. Not bad at all for the series' first RPG spin-off, and a cool team-up between the Persona 3 and 4 cast, but it often got a little too frustrating at times with dungeons and enemies. Fourth place is Persona Q2. It took mostly everything that worked in the previous game and made it better, though the difficulty at the start can be a bit too much, the bosses could have been less sadistic, and the climax wasn't the best in my opinion. Third place goes to Persona 3 slash FES slash Portable. I'm counting all versions as one entry, because they each have their pros and cons to balance each other out. I think the idea of Tartarus and the Dark Hour is incredible, and the game introduces social links which will become a series staple, but you can tell that the game still has some things to work out before it gets really good on all fronts. Second place is Persona 4 slash Persona 4 Golden. Fantastic game that learns from Persona 3's mistakes and easily one of the best in the series, with a more lighthearted tone and a great story to help that. And finally, at number one is Persona 5 slash Persona 5 Royal. I still think it has top tier gameplay, an incredible lineup of characters with the best chemistry in the entire series, and an amazing plot that's just as good as Persona 4's. I may have only been a fan of Persona for a few years now, but these games have been some of the best I've ever played. My favorite video game series right next to Metroid used to be Metal Gear Solid, but after playing Persona, it has to be right up there, man. These games really do a lot for me, even the ones I don't like as much as others. There's that secret ingredient Atlas puts in to make them so enjoyably charming and delightful that they keep reeling me in. They're unique RPGs that I have no problem playing over and over again. And while the characters aren't real, they certainly feel real to me. If you haven't played any of the Persona games, don't be like me where I was totally skeptical about them. And if they're definitely not for you, then fair enough, but at least give them a try, especially the later games. It also makes me very happy to see that my perspective on the Persona series have been some of my most viewed videos on this channel. I really appreciate you all coming back to see my thoughts and opinions for each game, and I hope it'll continue to stay that way in future videos. 
With all said and done, have yourselves a fantastic day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, thank you. But it's an interesting game and game. Uh, but it's an interesting game and. Uh, but it's an interesting. It's, why can't I do that? But it's an, it's an interesting game. But an interesting game and just and it's, yeah, God damn it! I can't say that. Why can't they say it? There has been a fran. <laughs> a fran. <laughs> Prince Taurus from holding a seminar with a machine controlling Kragare Kigare. I have no idea how to pronounce. It. <laughs> this particularly is the case if you have Tatsuya in your party who's whoa. <laughs> What is wrong with me today?